Hello and welcome um, to this RCVS Knowledge uh, webinar. Um, this is part, part five of a five-part series looking at infection control in veterinary practice. And this part will cover uh, auditing, uh, the use of audits and the role of auditing in benchmarking and monitoring infections and progress. Um, most of the presentation will be given by Dr. Pam Mosdale and we're very lucky to, to have her to present this. Um, Pam has spent uh, nearly all of her working life uh, based in practice, so she's fully aware of, of how practical this needs to be. Um, but she's also uh, well known to many of you as, as one of the country's leading experts uh, in infection control. Um, a couple of examples of that, she's a, a, a clinical advisor for the Bella Moss Foundation. Uh, she chairs the quality improvement panel for RCVS knowledge and she's also the lead assessor for the RCVS uh, practice standard scheme. Um, Pam will, uh, as I said, do most of the webinar and will cover uh, the theory uh, of auditing, why this is important, and then use some practical examples to illustrate its importance in infection control in veterinary practice. Uh, and then I um, sorry, I should have introduced myself, I'm Tim Nuttall, uh, will come in right at the end and just discuss a little bit about um, how to use auditing and benchmarking to look at um, trends in antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial use. So RCVS Knowledge um, uh, is an organization that is committed to advancing the quality of, of uh, veterinary care um, for animals, their owners, and the wider society. And it does this by championing the use of evidence-based uh, approaches to inspire a culture of continuous learning and quality improvement. And we do that by making our resources widely available to the veterinary profession and the wider public. Um, we must note that we are a separate organisation to the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, uh, even though we have RCVS uh, in our name. And if you go to the website at uh, www.rcvsknowledge.org, you can find out about more um, about us and our activities, and then also uh, get access to the incredibly wide range of support materials that are there. As I said earlier, this is part five uh, in a five part series. Um, so just draw your attention to, to the whole series uh, of webinars that have been looking at infection control. Um, in, and the first webinar looked at the importance of infection control and steps that uh, might need to be taken to enhance this uh, and adapt to working during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but then obviously all the other infection control threats that we see in practice haven't changed. So part two has looked at current organisms of concern and how these can be transmitted within um, veterinary practices. Part three um, looked at infection control uh, uh, policies and procedures in practice. Uh, part four covered different um, types of disinfectants and how to use these and other uh, infection control procedures more, more effectively. Um, and this will be part five, uh, again, as I said, looking at auditing and benchmarking. Okay, thank you, Tim. So I'm going to talk to you now about um, auditing infection control measures. What I'm going to try and cover, or Tim and I are going to try and cover, is um, what, what clinical audit is and, and how is it anything to do with infection control. Things that we can audit, like um, cleaning protocols, like checklists, like hand hygiene, the role of surveillance, auditing things like post-operative complications, which can give us an idea of the, the um, state of infection in the practice, benchmarking, significant events, and as Tim said, he's going to talk about antimicrobial resistant organisms at the end. So I'm going to start off, um, for any of you who don't know, what, talking about quality improvement. What is it then? So quality improvement, or QI, is the uh, it's not just a program that um, on, on the telly with Sandy Toxwig and um, QI is the combined efforts of everyone to make changes to lead to better patient outcomes, better performance as a system, better systems of work and better learning, better professional development. 
and surely that is what everybody in veterinary practice wants in, in all the areas where we work to, to improve the outcomes for our patients, to improve the systems of work for ourselves and, and to learn from things. So I'm going to use the quality improvement tools to talk about audit of infection control. Those of you who are interested in quality improvement, I would recommend the RCVS um, Knowledge Quality Improvement website. And if you look on resources there, you'll see uh, as on the screen here that there are resources there about clinical audit, about writing guidelines and protocols, about using checklists, about benchmarking, about significant events. All the things we're going to talk about are all there. There are CPD courses for most of them, which are free CPD. There are case examples for, for all of them. So I'd um, really recommend that you, that you have a look at those. But what I'm going to hopefully do now is see how we can apply some of those quality improvement tools to looking at infection control. Okay, so clinical audit then. Um, what is it? Well, it's basically just about um, understanding what we do, measuring what we do, um, collecting data in an area of our practice uh, and seeing what results we're getting. If you don't measure things, then how can you know how, effect, how clinically effective you're being or how effective your, um, your cleaning is? If you don't measure it, you don't know what needs to improve. You might measure it and find that you're doing absolutely great and nothing needs to improve. Or you might measure it and see that there's some room for improvement. But that's what audit's for. It's there to monitor and assess um, areas and look for areas where it could be improved and then put that improvement into place. So how is this relevant to infection control then? Well, as I said before, just said, it's, it's about providing real data for the practice, things that actually applies to your particular practice, not just generalised things, things that happen in your particular practice. So it'll give you real data in your practice about the areas where your infection control procedures are working well and maybe areas that could need improving. This will lead, I hope, to improved biosecurity generally, should lead to um, improved outcomes for patients and, will, and it should be safer, should be a safer culture for patients and also for the team because obviously some of these um, uh, infection control measures affect team health as well and that's particularly important at the moment. And looking at drawing up these um, protocols and guidelines and things um, does encourage um, the team to look at evidence-based medicine and, and incorporate that into the um, protocols and guidelines. So this is, I'm sure you've all seen the clinical audit cycle lots of times, but this one I really like um, rather than the traditional cycle. This is the one that uh, came from originally from the Royal College of General Practitioners, but it's also the one that RCVS Knowledge use. And basically you choose a topic, um, decide what you're going to measure. It's got to be something that happens very, um, very free, fairly frequently, or, or it's going to take an awful long time to collect your data. Uh, select exactly what you're measuring, exactly what your criteria are, set a target um, of what you want to achieve, collect the data, analyze the data. And then the really important thing is number six, look, discuss with the team what the barriers were. If, you, if your data is, if you haven't achieved your target, then discuss with the team what the barriers were. Why didn't we get to that target? And what can we do now to alter that? And the people who know that are the team on the ground, the team are actually doing things. It's no good discussing infection control uh, sort of at high level without discussing it with the people on the ground who are actually involved, everybody. It's a clinical audit is a whole team activity. So analyze the data, make the changes, implement the changes, and equally important, do it all again. Repeat it, re-audit, um, and see what, whether the changes you've made have actually had any effect or not. Um, and then review and reflect and decide when you might need to audit again. Okay, so getting on to infection control then. I'm sure that most of you have cleaning protocols. And if you look at the webinar um, that Liz Branscombe did, number three in our series, there's an awful lot there about cleaning protocols um, and having cleaning protocols for different areas of the practice. And there will be different requirements for different areas. Of, and in those protocols, um, drawing up, looking at the evidence base, what you should clean, with what, how often, who does it, all those things in, in detail. And then what most practices proceed to having are checklists, cleaning checklists um, up on the wall that can be ticked when certain cleaning um, things have been carried out. 
Now, a lot of practices think that it's best to have these as paper because then they can keep them and they can, therefore they can do an audit and keep an eye on them. But from an infection control point of view, it's not so good that they're paper, but they really need to be as laminated, laminated so they can be just um, written on with a, 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 suit, a suitable um, pen that writes on them and can be wiped off. So that's the question then. If you use these checklists, that's fine. You can see on the day whether it's been done, but how would you audit it? Well, my recommendation for auditing checklists, cleaning checklists, would be that somebody goes around and takes photos on their mobile phone at certain times, and you can do it at different times on different days, just to see what's been done. And then looking at these, you can look back and go, okay, well, this cleaning task is always done, but this cleaning task has not been done by four o'clock in the afternoon. Why has that not happened? And then talk to the team and find out, well, we couldn't do that because we're very busy in clinics at that time and whatever. So look for the barriers, make some changes and then do it all over again. So another way to look at auditing cleaning is using a self audit tool, which uh, Bella Moss Foundation have on their website and which myself and Tim um, and Louise O'Dwyer, who's unfortunately no longer with us, we drew this up. Basically, we, we did draw up those cleaning protocols that we, I was just discussing for every single area of the practice. Um, they need to be personalised to the practice, um, but it mentions every single thing that's in there and how often it should be cleaned and with what and by who. So practices can use those. But then the other thing is to try and um, monitor and audit how that's working. So one way to do this is using the app, which can be on your mobile phone. And I think the key here is to send somebody around who's not the person who's done the cleaning, someone else, go around, and there's a little checklist there with um, a score. So it'll say, you know, is the floor clean right into the corners? Is the sink clean? Is the plug hole clean? Things like that. And there's a yes, no for each one. And there's, that's for every area. And then at the end, it will give you an overall hygiene score if the person has been around the whole practice for the whole practice which might be hopefully something like 98%, but it might be 70%. And then you need to look at the areas that didn't score and start looking at um, what you can do and why that didn't happen. And again, make changes. And this is such, such a simple little um, self audit tool that you can use it really regularly. So um, I would definitely recommend that. Okay, let's get on to a clinical audit then of hand hygiene. Very, very topical at the moment, obviously, hand hygiene, very, very important. I mean, how many times have we been told by the government about washing our hands and washing our hands for longer and singing happy birthday or whatever it was they told us to sing? Um, but basically, I'm going to describe to you uh, an, or out, an audit by um, Gillian White, RVN, who's very kindly agreed to let me use this, which was carried out at uh, Vets Now in Glasgow. And their hand hygiene audit was by observation of team members, by watching people and marking a chart of what they do and when. Now, the only thing I would say at the beginning of this, um, before we look at the results, is that audits that you do by observation are really, really useful, but you can tend to get something called the Hawthorne effect. Whereas when you're watching people and they know that you're watching them, they will improve what they're doing. It's called the Hawthorne effect. It was a, um, a factory in Chicago, in a place called Hawthorne, that they first noticed this. So it's the effect of people observing you can, can make you do things um, better. So the results can sometimes be higher, but I think people get used to it and, and after the uh, start to forget that you're, that you're watching them eventually. So um, this, they chose key moments that where they thought hands should be washed. And these would be before any contact with a patient, after any contact with a patient, before an aseptic task, after exposure to bodily fluids, and after exposure to patient surroundings. So on all those occasions, the team member, and they looked at all team members, I said already that it's a whole team activity. This is a matter of looking at all team members from the most senior vets in the practice, um, through all the vets and nurses and, and all the, um, and, and any kennels staff and everybody else, all were watched to see what they, when they washed their hands. So it was just a yes, no. Did they, did they actually um, wash their hands properly? Um, yes or no. And did they do it at those times? And the reasons for non-compliance were that they didn't do that at those times, but also so they just didn't do them or they didn't do them properly. And that was that they hadn't taken off jewellery or watches. They weren't um, bare below the elbow. They hadn't rolled their sleeves up. 
The soap is put on before they'd wet their hands. They wash their hands too quickly. They used hand gel when they should have washed their hands. Turning off taps with your hands rather than the elbows, even though they were elbow taps. Um, not washing hands after gloves are removed. And we're putting the, 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 um, the anything into the bin by operating the bin by hand rather than using the foot pedal. So I think those are all things that, you know, especially when we're rushing, that we can um, fail on, <laughs> or we can forget to wash our hands entirely, or we can not comply by not washing our hands in the correct manner and by some of those, some or all of those things happening. So to give them a bit more detail, as well as their yes, no, they did have a code for, for why somebody hadn't complied, as in didn't do it at all, or one of these things happened. So um, these were their results, which they kindly shared with me. Um, they were people were complying 81% um, of the time in January and March, 80% of the time, April to June. But then July to September, it went down to 72%. And when they looked at that, they were having hospital refurbishment at the time and there was probably less access um, to sinks. So numbers had gone down a little bit. And so what they did was discuss all this, discuss their results. And as I say, um, discuss it with the whole team. So everybody was like, okay, what are the barriers? Why aren't you washing your hands then? Is it just that you've forgotten or is there some physical problem? Um, what do we need to do to make this better? And this was after they'd had the slightly lower results. Um, so what they did to remind people, because it's easy to forget, there was hand washing signage at sinks and hand washing stations. And that was to remind people to do it properly as well as, I mean, obviously they're going to the sink, so they're going to do it, but to remind them to do it properly and how long you should do it for them. To have um, automatic, and we'll have anything that's a system of work is better, isn't it, than having to remember. And so having automatic things is much, much better. So systems of work here are having the, um, the elbow taps, the, um, the magic eye taps. They're also having automatic soap dispensers. So you don't, the team members don't need to touch taps. They don't need to touch soap pump devices. Um, again, another system of work, pedal bins, foot operated pedal bins. So um, nobody has to touch um, the top of bins, which can be a, a, an area where, where infection really builds up. And I'm really, really keen, and, and the whole um, patient safety and QI initiative is a lot about putting systems of work in place. Because I say, uh, we'll all make human errors, we'll all forget things, we're, we all do, I, I certainly do. Um, but if there's a system of work in place, you're much, much more likely to follow it. Um, and when it's automatic to do it right, rather than automatic to do it wrong. And they also had more access to um, sterilium and antibacterial hand rub. So they re-registered their results and they were already starting to go up October to December as, um, their, as the um, refurb was finishing. And they're doing that on an ongoing basis. So I think that's a lovely, easy hand, or, um, hand washing audit that anybody in practice could do. You just pick a day and somebody goes around and checks um, what, what people are doing. Uh, and, and then you actually have some evidence to take to the meeting, because if you just start discussing at a practice meeting, OK, let's talk about hand washing. Everybody's going to go, yeah, yeah, we, we do that. We wash our hands properly. Of course, we are, because we all think we're doing it right. Um, but having some actual evidence, not to blame any individuals, but to say, right, well, you know, only only 72 percent of you are actually washing your hands at the right time. Um, it's a lot more powerful and then you can get everybody on board and everybody together can decide what you do rather it's not a matter of um, blaming somebody for not doing it it's a matter of getting the whole team on board to decide what can we do to make it easier for us to do this and the other thing is client reassurance isn't it now this is um, a screenshot I, I took when I um, went with my husband for an appointment to our local local hospital and in the, one of those TVs they have in reception that goes round and round and we had to wait for quite a while so I did see it go round a few times and had enough time on the second or third occasion of it going round to take a couple of screenshots. So this um, human hospital was boasting that in the third quarter of 2019 they scored 95% on hand hygiene compliance which is great and some, definitely something to boast about but it's, wouldn't it be nice if your practice could be reassuring your clients especially in current circumstances about hand hygiene in your practice. So I think it can be, um, you know, as well as being very, very important from a clinical point of view, it can be a good point to actually um, be promoting the practice. So 
the, we talk a little bit about um, ways that we can be sure that, in, that, in, there's, that the environment is clean. And one way is by active surveillance, which is um, doing things like taking swabs and culturing um, and using things like the um, ATP monitors, which will look at residue of organic material or marking surfaces with fluorescent markers and then doing the normal cleaning and then going along with a, a UV light, woods lamp, very handy, just to see whether the fluorescent mark is still there. But I'm not going to go into that in detail because this has been covered in lots of detail um, by Liz Branscombe in Infection Control 3. So those of you who are interested in active surveillance of the environment, I would recommend if you haven't already watched it, to watch our third webinar and, they, and Liz will talk about that quite a lot more for you. But what we can also do is passive surveillance. So when we do things like audit surgical site infections or audit the complications of procedures um, or monitor antimicrobial use patterns and bacterial culture, we are actually looking at those things which will give us an idea of how our whole practice hygiene is. Because if the practice hygiene is not good, there are going to be more surgical site infections, more complications, and there's going to be more antimicrobial use and, and we're going to see the bacteria on the culture. So for this section I'm going to talk about uh, one and two and later Tim will talk to us about three and four. So one way to um, do passive surveillance is to audit post-operative complications of routine neutering procedures and there is a very good um, uh, list of how we would do this on, on the VET audit website, which is, is, is on our CBS Knowledge website. And basically what has to happen is that everybody who's looking at um, doing post-op checkups, everybody in the practice is doing them, has to use the same criteria in order to um, classify what they see. So this is the criteria on, on the VET audit website and it's, um, it's quite simple, but the main, main thing is before starting this, as with all clinical audit, is to have a meeting discuss with the team what you're going to do, explain how it's going to happen, explain that this is not about branding VET A or VET B as having more post-op infections than anybody else. It's about looking at whole practice performance. And it's very, very important that everybody understands this classification, zero to five, because if the information is not put into the right classes, then the information we get out at the other end is not going to be useful. So using this, you can say, well, group zero ran off. Group one, absolutely fine, no complications. Group two, well, it's a little bit pink. Oh dear, it's a little bit pink, but it's fine. We don't need to do anything. Group three, oh dear, we've got an um, infection or um, maybe we've got something that's very painful. I need to use medical treatment. Group four, oh dear, we're going to have to resuture the wound because the, the sutures are out and, and, and there's a surgical complication. And group five, oh dear, we've lost the animal. So that's quite simple, but it is important that everybody in the team knows those, um, those groups um, if they're going to use it. So it's a really easy way for practices to do this passive surveillance, to do this audit of post-op complications of routine neutering procedures, and a very useful thing to do. So once they've done that, once the practice has done their own um, audit of post-op complications and got their own figures, then if they wish, they can submit them to the National Audit for Small Animal Neutering, where the, the, the practice's own figures can be benchmarked against those figures for other practices. So it's really, really useful because we're all a little bit competitive, aren't we? So we like to think that we're doing just as well as our, as our neighbours, but also it is really useful to, to look at trends, etc. So this is post-operative complications of routine neutering in cats, dogs and rabbits now. Rabbits have been added. And you can look at the results of this on the RCBS website. And even more excitingly, this is, there's plans for this to be expanded to include other surgical procedures going forward. So that should be even better. So looking at the results there, 75%, absolutely complication free. That's great. Um, spays, more complications than castrates in cats and dogs. I think we'd, that's what we'd expect. But the reverse in rabbits, that's interesting. Um, Cats, fewer complications than dogs. Yeah, cats are very good at um, healing from anything, aren't they? Um, 35 animals died as a result of the neutering, including one rabbit. Um, and then in 25% of the bitch space, there was some form of complication. 
and quite a lot were lost to follow up and a lot of those I'm sure will be cats that ran off and didn't come back for their checkup. So that inf information could be really useful um, when a practice looks at their own results and benchmarks them against a national result. So look, this is what a practice that did this. Um, so looking at their results compared to a benchmark, we've got the benchmarks in red um, for the different ones. So no abnormality, 82%, abnormal no treatment, 9.5%, abnormal medical treatment, 7.5%, surgical treatment, 1%, and death, 0.1%. So this practice had three branches and they were discussing different things about different things at different branches and they wanted to, to see how they were doing. So they all um, submitted data um, to the benchmarking and did their own um, clinical audit in-house. So we can see that they're, they're doing really well with death of animal, that's great. Now it's just about on the mark really with surgical treatment or even a little bit better at some of the branches, um, but their medical treatment was quite a lot higher. The benchmark 7.5% and we got the, the lowest they had is 10.5% up to 14% at another branch. So overall their medical treatment was quite a lot higher than the benchmark. So this led this practice to start thinking, I wonder what that, why that is then. So they then started looking for those ones in, the, in that group three um, um, to find out what it was, that what the medical treatment was. And they found out in this particular practice that the majority, and the majority by far, the medical treatment was antibiotic. And in some cases it was non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, but it was often antibiotic. So this led them then to look at the practice hygiene to look at um, cleaning protocols, to look at um, pre-surgical prep, uh, which again Liz covers in her webinar, um, to look at all those things um, and to start thinking, what can we change? And then they're going to carry on with not only doing their own audit, but carry on with submitting it to the um, benchmarking, to the national audit. So having done this has not only shown them what's going on in their own practice, but they can compare it and they can start looking at what they can do and what barriers there might be um, to improving that. So there's lots of other case examples, loads of them on the RCBS website. Have a look at um, Louise Northway, um, who was the Knowledge Award champion, um, who had an audit, of, a very um, comprehensive audit of post-operative complications. And she reckoned that assessing, well, she, doesn't, not that she reckoned, she knew from her results that assessing hygiene and post-op care guidelines, that's the other thing, giving owners guidelines of how to look after the animals when they get home, cut complications by half, which is amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing, just for doing an audit. And another um, um, Knowledge Award champion, Phil Vets, did a hygiene audit by uh, people self-assessing and by a, a questionnaire um, that they filled in about what they did. So you can do it by observing, as the vets now did, did one did, or, or by self-assessment. Um, so there's some great case examples there. Please, please have a look. It might get, inspire you with some ideas to use in your own practice, I hope. And again, client reassurance. Uh, again, same thing, same hospital, as I took this picture as well. Um, and they were very pleased to say that although using the national benchmark of 5% of patients undergoing surgical procedures develop a surgical site infection, that their results in November 2019 was 0.9%. Again, something, something to definitely um, crow about and something that you can share with your clients. And I think it also has um, a useful role in informed consent. When clients go, okay, what are the risks? If you can talk about risks, but say, you know, you can actually tell them what the, uh, what the risk of post-op complications are in your practice normally. Um, and that's and the important thing with consent is it is informed and we should be explaining all the risks. So I think that's, um, they're really useful things to do. They can be used very positively. Okay, I'm going to move on to significant event audit now. Um, in human healthcare, they do um, they have critical incidents where things have, there's been harm to, to patients and and they, those are analysed and they have M and M morbidity and mortality meetings, not the sweets um, M and M meetings to, to look at clinical things that go wrong. But in GP practice, what they started to do was look at what they defined as significant events, which can be anything. And that thought by anyone in the practice team to be significant in the care of patients or the conduct of the practice. 
So it's not just about anaesthetic deaths or um, you know, major dispensing errors. It's not just about those things. It's also about things um, like hygiene and about things like um, uh, lab samples that don't go off or um, you know, bodies that go for the wrong cremation or client complaints, all those kind of things. And also positive things, look at positive things too and how well they've gone. So it's a form of clinical audit, but it's a qualitative rather than quantitative form. So there's no numbers involved here. I like this one because there's no numbers. Um, but it still needs a structured framework. It still needs to work through it. And it's looking at one case, one single event from beginning to end and drilling down into it and looking for the root causes and trying to find out exactly what happened um, and then making some changes. So our significant event audit, sorry, acronym there, our significant event audit um, is going to be about Barney. Barney um, had been, uh, had a, an encounter with a car, unfortunately, and finished up with an orthopedic procedure which didn't heal properly, had a non-healing wound. Um, it had been going on for a while, so practice thought, okay, we need to swab this, took a swab, but unfortunately, this is where the first of the errors occurred, the swab was never sent to the lab. Um, time went on, um, they didn't realise the swab hadn't gone to the lab because they've got a system for following it, which we'll talk about in a minute, never realised it hadn't gone. Um, eventually, they swabbed it again, um, and when that came back, it was MRSP. And over the next few weeks, there were more cases of MRSP from the practice. And Barney had been admitted to the practice because he wouldn't leave the wound alone and he couldn't keep any dressings on it at home. So he was admitted to the practice. And after this, over the next few weeks, there were more cases of MRSP and animals that had been inpatients of the practice. So I think this is definitely a very, very significant event and a perfect thing to look at with a significant event review. So the thing with significant event audits is to gather information and the team to discuss in a meeting. Now, again, I can't stress enough, this is whole team, whole team to discuss it, not just the vets, not just the nurse, the vets and the nurses, everybody, the reception team, the practice manager, everybody. And the important thing with that meeting is that it should be um, quite clear to everybody that it's to improve systems, not to blame individuals. Because if we don't have that open, fair, honest, culture going on people are going to be worried about saying anything so it's got to be looking to look at systems um, not to not to be putting the blame onto somebody for what they did or didn't do um, as i said before systems of work are the really important thing so this meeting should be um open it's good to have somebody to um to sort of coordinate the meeting and to make sure that it stays on those lines and that to draw it back if if people do start going down down other lines and it's not to apportion blame, but it is to, to encourage reflection. It is to encourage improvement. So this is what happened. And so the first thing to find out is what happened. And that's by collecting together all the evidence by the accounts of people, things like consent forms, hospitalization sheets, anesthetic charts, if that's appropriate, any lab results, collect all those things together and then have all those, those bits of information and have all the accounts of the people involved and then look at, well, okay, what did really happen here? So what really happened here was that um, the first swab that was taken from Barney, um, where before he was admitted, was not labelled and it was not left and it was left in the fridge and nobody noticed it was there not labelled. It wasn't recorded in the in the lab book that it had been taken. So nobody even realised it not being sent off until Barney's owners said, what about that swab result? And the vet was like, oh, I can't find it on the records. Let's have a look. Oh, well. and then we had, everybody's running around like headless chickens as usual. And then they found that actually the swab was still in the fridge. So that's when um, they took another swab. Barney, as I say, had been kept in because at home he kept, uh, even with the buster colour on, he was ripping the dressings off, managing to get the buster colour off, get the dressings off. Um, the wound was very um, unpleasant and a big source of infection, so it needed to be covered. Um, so it was omitted. Because the, um, the, the, the first swab hadn't gone and before the results were received for the second swab, all the team in the practice weren't really, didn't know what, the, what was going on with Barney. And it was really, really busy. And usually with these things that go wrong, practices are really busy and that's part of the thing. And it was moved between at least three different um, kennels in, in the ward areas. Even when the result did come, nobody actually communicated it to, to, the, um, to the kennel assistants 
for another 24 hours. So he didn't get labelled as needing isolation or, or hygiene precautions to start with. Eventually he was moved to isolation once everybody realised what was going on. But then when they said, okay, well, where, where was Barney when he was in here then? Um, and various people said, oh, I remember he was in the end kennel. And then somebody else said, well, I thought he was in this one. And so nobody knew exactly which kennels Barney had been in when they started to look at it. So looking at why did it happen then, that's the next thing you found out what happened. So at the meeting you're going to say, well, why did this happen? So this is root cause analysis, actually looking and root cause analysis is really good because um, I think it's really good anyway, because you just, you don't accept the first thing that you think is the cause. You keep going, why, why? It remind, it, it, to me, it's a bit like returning to being a toddler and just going, why all the time? So why did it happen? Well, obviously the communication wasn't very good between the vets and, and, the, and the team who were looking after Barney and the kennels. Um, it, so they didn't label him for isolation, and, but the real uh, looking at that was because the, the, they had they'd not got the lab results. They hadn't got the lab results because the first sample didn't go off. They didn't have a lab tracking system. That was a, that was a really big thing here. If they'd had a lab tracking system that followed a lab sample from when it was taken to when it went to the lab to when you got the results to when the owner, the vet was told the results were there to when the owner was informed that the results were there then they would have seen that the first, somebody would have noticed that that first sample didn't go. So a lab tracking system was definitely not there. They also didn't know where, where Barney had been in the practice once he was admitted. So they didn't have a kennel log. And I think that's a really useful thing for practices to have to know exactly which, which um, cage an animal's been in so that they can follow up on any, on any hygiene um, issues. They didn't have any protocols for, for MRSP cases, for handling, how they would move them around the practice, how they would nurse them. And again, I can recommend um, webinar three for that because um, Liz Branscombe covered that in detail about moving infected cases around the practice and, and protocols for handling. So please watch that one. The other thing she covered was having somebody in the, in the practice um, responsible for infection control and for training the team in infection control. And that person is often the person who's also responsible for auditing infection control. But this practice didn't have everyone, anyone. They did have a biosecurity policy because they were in practice standards and we have to have a biosecurity policy. But they hadn't updated it. And most team members, when asked about it, didn't know where it was even, let alone what was in it. So, um, so they had it, but it wasn't really a, a living document and it wasn't a system of work. So this significant event audit might lead to what you need to do. Now, this is where, um, where you have to be careful. As I said before, it's about addressing those systems and not blaming the individuals. And we're trying to make sure that any negative outcomes are less likely to recur. We can never get rid of errors, um, but, and there'll always be human errors, but improving systems means that they're less likely to recur. So there's a few themes usually that come from significant event audits. Um, they might lead to realising that you need some training um, and CPD and I think here this practice that would be the case. They might lead to writing new guidelines or protocols um, or changing their existing guidelines or protocols um, because they're either not used um, uh, or are not appropriate and they might lead to doing some um, other audits, maybe some outcome audits. So in this practice, they looked at it and, well, what did they change? Well, basically, they got a, a, a person in, to be in charge of infection control. They updated their biosecurity policy and updated all their cleaning protocols and then made sure everybody actually knew about them, had the team training, because there's no point having bits of paper that say what you're going to do if it's not what you're actually going to do. Um, and that's the important thing. So team training and also team inputted into those updates on the um, on the protocols and, and the biosecurity policy, because again, it's no point somebody um, on high writing it, it's got to have input from the people who are actually doing it. Um, they um, did start to have a kennel log, um, to, so they knew where animals had been. They also started a lab tracking system, a lab log, so that they did know it, exactly when samples arrived. And, you know, and this is useful for so many other things, as well as infection control, because samples going astray can be a real problem. Um, they started auditing cleaning schedules, how they were are they auditing the checklists. They started um, a, an audit of, of, of routine neutering um, to do some surveillance that way. 
and they started looking at the culture and sensitivity of all samples sent away to, by the practice and looking at when they when they got results on um, antimicrobial resistance um, and started looking at practice antibiotic prescribing policy. So I think overall they, this incident, which must have been very negative at the time, led to an awful lot of good positive changes, which I'm sure improved biosecurity in the practice and made everybody in the practice feel better about, um, about infection control. So I'd really recommend that to, to, um, to anyone who's, um, you know, has these kind of incidents to use them positively. So I'm now going to hand over to Tim again, who's going to talk to us a bit more about passive surveillance. Thank you, Pam. Um, thank you for that uh, incredibly useful, um, uh, thorough and inspiring oversight about how to use uh, audit and, and benchmarking in practice. And the clinical uh, examples were, were fabulous. It's often uh, easy sometimes to dismiss these, these things as sort of uh, theoretical concepts that come out of people that live in ivory towers with no clinical experience and time on their hands. And I think showing how these things can be directly clinically relevant to improve the uh, practice experience uh, for the staff that work there, the patients that they care for, care for and their owners uh, is incredibly use useful and inspiring. Um, and what I'm going to do uh, just to finish up this presentation is look at uh, just some brief examples of, of how these techniques can be used to look at um, monitoring uh, antimicrobial infections and antimicrobial use patterns. And this very much follows on from, from Barney's case. So again, I'm just going to start off with uh, a clinical example. This was this was something that occurred uh, in the hospital that, that I work in. And what we have is a clinical uh, audit team, and this is quite quite a large team, but we're a big referral uh, teaching hospital. Um, and one of the jobs that I have on that team is to uh, review. Uh, the antimicrobial resistant and unusual uh, infections. Um, and w in that group, I work with our clinical microbiologist and our, and our lab team as well. And you can do this quite easily in practice. So again, it depends on the frequency of your samples, how many are coming through every month, um, whether an individual does this or a team does this, whether you review all the cultures that, that, that are, are coming back or whether you flag um, alerts. Now, what we tend to do simply because of the sheer volume of cultures that are, that are coming in and out of the hospitals uh, is we, we have an immediate alert system. And what we've done here is anything that's multi-drug resistant, so anything that's an antibiotic resistant uh, organism, and then any other unusual organisms of interest. So these are organisms that uh, have been flagged as important in hospital or healthcare acquired infections, which are known as nosocomial uh, infections, or are emerging uh, organisms of interest because of zoonotic potential or something like that. And in the second uh, webinar, so part two of this series, I, I um, went through a whole series of different um, bacteria mainly, but I also uh, looked at briefly at fungi and viruses and protozoa as well. And again, you can have a look at that webinar and, and you know, look at your practice the type of work that you do um, and, and select your sort of organisms uh, of interest. So coming back to this example, so, so we do, we have this immediate flag um, and we review uh, all uh, of the alert cases as they come in um, because there might be something that needs immediate attention. Um, and this is where we can immediately uh, flag and check that uh, treatment um, barrier control precautions, uh, zoonotic advice for an owner or so on is being immediately implemented. And then at a level up from that, we take a monthly look back and that allows us to spot uh, any emerging trends very rapidly. So in this example, we, we picked up, we'd seen five Burkholderia sapacea infections in one month. This is quite an unusual uh, bacteria. It's related to Pseudomonas. 
uh, it's quite widespread in uh, water sources and, and sources of stagnant water and things like that. And it's generally an environmental organism, but it can also be an opportunistic pathogen and it can cause, cause quite serious infections. Um, but it's not a particularly common infection. So this was an immediate um, cause of interest. So what we did is looked at the five cases in, in detail, going back through their clinical records and very quickly it became apparent that they'd all undergone bron uh, bronchoscopy within uh, a, a very close time period. So that allowed us to uh, home our, in, um, our investigation, if you will, um, and check into the bronchoscopy area. And to cut a long story short, we took a whole load, load of samples from there and discovered uh, the, the, the culture in the flexible bronchoscope. So the next thing we did um, was, was obviously suspended all use uh, of that. And again, obviously this is going to have a clinical impact. So at this point we want to be moving fairly quickly by working as a team. Um, so this is where we, um, we had clinicians involved. Uh, we had the infection control team. Um, we had some epidemiology uh, um, expertise as well. And then obviously we had the clinical microbiologist in there. And again, cut a long story short, um, we reviewed all the procedures and this seemed to have shown that, that the correct procedures are being followed. So it wasn't that somebody was skipping cleaning steps or anything like that. So we then looked at the automated cleaning machine um, and we cultured the, the same bacteria from that. Um, and then by running diagnostics on the machine, we discovered that it actually had a fault in its cleaning cycle uh, in that it wasn't uh, maintaining temperature. And that, that had allowed the bacteria to establish in the, uh, the water bath. Um, and that was immediately uh, cleared up. Um, and so within, uh, and this, this was um, within a, a week. So for, within a week, we'd gone from identifying the problem um, to discovering uh, the cause, correcting that, and then back on to our, our passive surveillance again. So that was just a very good clinical example of how this um, passive surveillance can alert you to take um, active measures in practice. So this is a, a, another thing we do. So um, as I said, we, we have that sort of immediate flag um, for the very serious um, organisms, and this is to try and avoid any, any serious events further down the line. Uh, we then have uh, the monthly review, uh, which allows us to respond very quickly to any emerging trends or problems that, that we see. Uh, we then have a quarterly review, uh, which is where we go back um, and look to see whether, whether we've got any slightly longer term uh, trends, issues or repetitive things that are happening um, that we can then raise through the um, the, the equivalent of our significant event a reporting system or, or a clinical audit system to feed back. So this could be um, just examples. Uh, we, it could be that we noticed that um, dogs with MRSP weren't being labelled as such uh, in the hospital. So there wasn't, there wasn't any visual reminder on the kennel or uh, the appropriate advice sheets not going out to the, um, to the owners. Um, that cultures weren't taken when they should have been taken. So we can immediately feed back and look at ways to improve our performance on that. And then we also do uh, an annual review and this gives us uh, an overview, but then also a backwards view to see how we're doing on a year to year basis. Um, are the things that, that we're doing well or are the trends emerging that we need to be uh, concerned about? So this is, um, just some data that I've, I've put together. So this is the number of our antimicrobial resistant uh, isolates, so the bacteria that we isolated. And you can see that we were pretty static in 2015 and 16, and then we saw this, this jump uh, in 2017. Um, and then we've plateaued off a bit in 2018 and 19. Now, one of the problems here is that that, that gives you the overall figure, but what's more important um, is, is how this relates to percentage of cases because raw data like that can disguise um, uh, the, you know, the fine detail. So in the next slide, um, what I've done is, is, is corrected the data in terms of the percentage of cultures that were taken. 
Um, so because you could have argued 2017, we saw this big jump um, because uh, we we were seeing more cases. And if you actually think about that uh, uh, in terms of the number we're coaching, we were a lot busier, but we also did see uh, an absolute increase in our antimicrobial resistant isolates. So again, 2015 and 16, we were pretty stable. So this big jump in 2017, and that's when we really started looking at um, tidying up our infection con uh, control rules, uh, looking at our training, looking at our uh, auditing, um, and partly because at, at this stage we, we'd seen a big um, increase in the number of cases we were seeing and consequently the number of staff that we have in the hospital uh, as well. So it was time time to have a look at that because things can easily get um, lost in the, in the, um, in the woodwork. Um, and since then what we've seen is a, is a gradual decline. So 2018 and then into 2019 um, we've seen it, we've seen this drop um, in the organisms uh, in percentage terms. And this is despite the hospital actually getting busier um, in 2018 uh, and in 2019. And we could also um, have a look at where our infections are. Um, and this can uh, tell us, you know, the frequency we're finding organisms in different sites, species or activities, which can tell us where we need to concentrate our monitoring, uh, our uh, training uh, um, and, and other activities. Um, and you can see from, from uh, this, uh, I won't go into this in detail, but you can see that something like um, just over three quarters of our cases are associated with um, urinary tract infections, uh, wound infections, and those could be surgical or, or well, it's both surgical and traumatic, um, and skin and ear infections with everything else making up less than a, less than a quarter of our cases. So um, that's where we tend to see things. Um, so for examples, uh, examples here, we would be tending to culture these um, at admission um, or a lot sooner. Um, we would target the cultures. We would also treat anything suspicious as though it's antimicrobial resistance, resistant until uh, proven otherwise. Um, change some of our handling procedures beca because we know that the, um, the odds there uh, we, we've increased the odds in terms of these cases. And then knowing what we've got, so what, uh, what bacteria um, are there in here can also be useful um, because this can look at our treatment procedures and also our disinfection procedures as well. We can look at zoonotic risk, we can look at routes of transmission and again target effective control measures uh, on there. So uh, just looking at, at um, this group you can see that the metacillin resistant staphylococci, so that's MRSA, MRSP and then we've got some staph schlepherei and some coagulase negative staphs uh, as well, that's the MRSE, um, make up um, something like about a third of our um, um, organisms and we're but what we're seeing is um uh, and we've we've seen an increase in the number of uh, gram, uh, antimicrobial resistant gram negative organisms so those are the esbls which is the extended spectrum beta lactamase producers and the amp c producers and the little other group there are other organ other organisms of interest morganella for example is um an emerging nosocomial um, pathogen um, so if you remember back a couple of slides ago, I said that we'd seen um, quite a substantial decrease in the uh, percentage um, in terms of our caseload in the percentage of antimicrobial um, uh, resistant infections. And I haven't shown you all the data, but hidden within that data was we've seen a very substantial drop um, in the, uh, the, the number of metacillin resistant staphylococci we're seeing predominantly MRSA and MRSP. Um, and that is some, it has also been seen in human hospitals. And this is because we're often con concentrating on better handling of patients, uh, better hygiene, better hand washing and better uh, surface disinfection. Um, but what this uh, graph indicated, and in the next slide, 
uh, is that we'd actually seen um, a relative increase in these antimicrobial resistant gram negative bacteria. And when I looked at the absolute numbers, disguised within our overall drop here was an absolute increase uh, in both the uh, AMPC producing gram negatives and the ESBL um, uh, producing gram ne negatives. And these are gut borne bacteria. Um, and controlling them is a little bit different and, and in some ways can be a little bit more challenging than the, the more surface-borne staphylococcal bacteria. And again, this trend towards the, these um, gram-negative organisms uh, is something that's being seen in human medicine. And although our numbers aren't huge at the moment, it's something very much we're keeping an eye on and beginning to review our animal handling and infection control procedures to take uh, these gram-negative bacteria uh, into account. And one of the important drivers um, for the increase in resistance amongst these gut bacteria is antimicrobial use. And hand in hand with um, clinical audit and monitoring uh, of antimicrobial resistant bacteria um, must go um, monitoring of antimicrobial use and antimicrobial stewardship because at the end of the day, uh, to use that terrible cliche, um, the, the most important way to control these bacteria is not to have them in the first place. And this means using um, fewer syst um, systemic antibiotics and, and uh, only using them where necessary um, and trending towards the, the most first tier or the lowest tier, most narrow spectrum drugs that we can wherever possible. Uh, and that means, again, you have to know how the practice is doing in terms of antimicrobial use. And in the next slide, uh, this is just an illustration um, of how you can start to do this. Now, you can do it through your own uh, records. It's just for a lot of practices, that's actually quite difficult because abstracting uh, the data about uh, the use of individual antibiotics and, and treatment courses um, can be time consuming uh, and difficult to analyze. And, and uh, again, it depends a bit on your practice software, um, but the and, the and the sales data, uh, which is the easiest way to do it, tends to give a very crude picture because it'll tell you how much antibiotic you're using. But it really, what's more important is how that is being used and who it's being used in. So it's the courses of treatment um, that, that are more important than, than the simple headline overall use figures, although they, they can give a crude, a crude estimate. Now, one way um, that a practice can be helped with this is by engaging with the um, MySavsNet AMR program. And uh, this is run by uh, the SavsNet group um, who uh, uh, run out of the University of Liverpool, initially supported by um, BSAVA. And uh, they uh, work by using practice, interrogating practice software systems. Um, and SavsNet does a whole ton of, of stuff where they can look at almost anything you do um, and, and, and um, abstract data on that, which has been incredibly useful in looking at big data projects in um, all sorts of angles of, um, of animal health and veterinary practice. Uh, and they do this by inserting what in effect is a, is a virus, although they, I know they don't like to use that term because it's negative connotations, uh, onto your practice software. And then that can be activated to um, uh, abstract data and then also prompt some data uh, inputs as well. And the way the MySavsNet AMR works is by looking at antimicrobial uh, use. And then what they do is provide uh, information like this, which allows you to um, benchmark uh, the, the practice use of antimicrobials uh, against all of the other practices that, that, that are involved in, in the system. Um, and as Pam showed with the surgical site um, um, in complication uh, data, then that can be a little bit of a prompt to say, um, 
are we doing okay compared to the others? Are, are we um, are we better? Which is great, but it's not, you know, don't uh, become complacent. You know, look at what you're doing well and keep doing it. Um, or is the use creeping up in relative terms? At which point that will be a prompt to say, um, let's have a look at our procedures. Is there something we can do differently? Is there something that we can do better um, to to encourage better stewardship? So um, uh, I would just personally like to thank um, uh, Pam for, for her presentation, which, as, as I said, was, uh, it was excellent, thorough uh, and inspiring. Um, and I say clinical audit tends to be the, the you know, the, the forgotten cousin, really, of infection control, because um, it, it can often seem like hard work. Um, it can seem difficult to organise. Uh, and implement, and I think Pam has shown how how this, you know, the tools that can be used to help you do this, and how it really is an integral part in infective infection control programs. Uh, and I'd also like to thank RCVS Knowledge uh, for supporting um, the the, uh, the the this program. Um, for looking for supporting the quality improvement programs, um, infection and infection control, and other aspects of, of veterinary practice, and for organising this series of seminars. I say there's five now in the series, which will all be available uh, on the website and can be very very useful uh, for training. Uh, if you have any questions, the email is there to um, to get in touch with us, and we'll do our best to answer them as quickly as we can. Thank you again. And thank you, Tim, for your um, for your contribution there. That was really, really interesting. I mean, it's such um, an important subject, isn't it? Um, antimicrobial resistance. So thank you. That was that was brilliant. Um, and thank you um, from all of us to, to uh, Amelia at RCBS Knowledge for actually being the technical person behind all these webinars. Thank you, Amelia. <laughs>